Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. This is a workshop on teaching strategies for engaging students, rethinking long lectures. Now, I know we've offered this workshop in the past, uh, but currently we are all, I believe, working from remote locations. And so I really wanted to tailor this workshop uh, to address those concerns and those needs. So this has evolved a little bit. We're really going to try to come up with specific strategies uh, that you can apply in your own uh, virtual online classrooms right now. So hopefully these strategies are something that you can use uh, pretty much as soon as you walk away. And if you have to leave early, don't worry, we are recording the session, so I will send you the link after we've completed the session. All right, so here's our agenda for today. And um, all of these topics kind of nicely segue into one another. The first thing that we're going to look at is a very basic template for how to organize an effective lecture. Now, it's a very plain template, but it does work well. So for the sake of argument, just we had something to look at. I wanted to make sure that I brought this to your attention. Um, and then we're going to take a look at what's going on with lectures currently. So what's happening with your students and why are they behaving the way that they're behaving? Uh, what are some things that you can do? And of course, we're going to look at techniques that you can use, kind of preemptive measures. Are there things that we can do right off the bat just to you know, engage our students and kind of get out of this rut that I think many people are experiencing with their long lectures? So hopefully this all sounds good to you. If I'm going too fast, let me know. Um, any questions or concerns, please, again, feel free. You can uh, raise your hand. There's a little icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, or you can hop on the microphone. And of course, the chat pod is always open. All right, let's start with our model of an effective lecture. So currently, I would say that there are two main formats of lectures going on right now. Um, there are the recorded lectures that instructors are posting to their Blackboard courses so that their students can watch them asynchronously. And then, of course, there are also the lectures where you may have a, a synchronous course. Maybe you're meeting virtually, and there's different platforms for that. You could be using Collaborate, Teams, maybe Zoom. Um, and hopefully your students are attending and you're completing your lecture there, kind of in replacement of a face-to-face -face class. So there are these two types of lectures that we have right now with our remote locations. Um, but this model that you see presented on the screen is supposed to um, kind of model this effect that we want our students engaged with the lecture. It's no longer just you speaking, hopefully, to your students, although I have heard some concerns maybe that um, if you're in a Zoom session and your students have their cameras turned off, maybe you don't even know if they're there. So uh, this is kind of a way to rethink your lecture. Uh, the very beginning, you're going to talk to your students about your goal, and this could be even a course objective or a specific learning objective, uh, even for the week. You might have a presentation, so you can elaborate on a specific topic, give them that new information that they need, maybe incorporate some multimedia resources, right? And then there's the interactions, and then we have some different ones. Of course, there's going to be the faculty to the student uh, interaction. You might call on somebody or if someone has a question. There's the student connecting with their content, actively learning something new, and of course the student-to-student -student interactions. So this could be something like um, if you're doing a synchronous session, this could be breakout rooms asynchronously, maybe you have discussion boards going, and a type of formative assessment. If I didn't mention this earlier, a formative assessment really is any type of assessment uh, that is done during the actual course, maybe where students are being graded. Uh, but it, it again, it's assessing their learning. So it could be polling, it could be chat, and then the conclusion. So this is um, a model of that type of lecture. Uh, we're trying to incorporate our students. We want them actively engaged. So 
we're going to break this up into pieces and talk about strategies that we can do um, with each of these little chunks. And I saw a few more of you just entered, so welcome. Um, if you missed the first part of the workshop, don't worry, this is being recorded. All right, so let's move on to the next piece here. And I'd like to actually engage with all of you. So how do we go about organizing an effective lecture? Okay, so hopefully at the top of your screen, you should have a couple of different icons. If you don't see them, let me know. Uh, one of them looks like a big capital T. Uh, if you click on that and then you click on the middle of the screen here, um, we're actually going to use the whiteboard so you can type your text. What do you suspect your students are doing uh, during your lectures? And this may vary now than how you would have answered previously when you were in a face-to-face -face classroom. Yes, I see somebody who typed hello. So yes, all right, great. And you can change the color of your text as well. If you see like a little blue dot, you can click on that um, and that'll change the color. So enjoy, have fun. Oh yes, I should have cautioned you as you're using the whiteboard, um, sometimes your words will overlap other people who have entered text, so you may need to actually physically change the location of your text. So I see some interesting answers here. Um, some of them are paying attention during your lectures. Who knows? Hopefully listening, All right? They like to read the slides along with listening. Yes, absolutely, they do enjoy this. And for some students, this is actually necessary since we really don't know what each of our students are going through right now during the pandemic. Um, they might have a lot of distractions in the background. And uh, for some students, it's actually easier to turn off the audio and to use captions to read along. So great point. Some of them are giving you visual feedback that they are attending, sometimes responding, sometimes eating their lunch. Yes, it'll happen. Taking notes, good. Some of them type questions in the chat. All right, so sometimes we know what they're doing, sometimes we don't, sometimes we hope for the best. If any of you are teaching synchronous sessions right now, um, you know, you might have cameras on, you might not. So there, there's a lot of different variables that can affect this. Sometimes they're chatting with each other via Discord. Yes, this will happen. All right, so I'm gonna clear the board and we're gonna go to the next slide. So. so why is this happening? What are they doing? Well, we have been telling our faculty, well, please don't take it personally. I will be the first one to attest, even in a face-to-face -face classroom, I didn't make eye contact a lot of times if there was a lecture going on. Uh, part of my active learning was just synthesizing the information. Um, I could find it actually distracting to look at a person. And so certainly this is amplified if we're talking about synchronous online sessions. Zoom fatigue is a very real thing. If your class is only an hour long, uh, consider how long they have to sit in front of this camera as well as for other courses. So we do ask you, maybe don't take it personally. Um, and lapses in attention do occur throughout the day. So something that we've learned with these uh, lectures that we're giving our students is to try to break them up. And now I have heard the argument that students would come to class for an entire hour, so why can't they do it um, online? Well, it is a different setting. So when your students came to class, uh, they, they left a lot of other variables behind. 
right? Now they're in their homes. Uh, some of them might be trying to log in from work because they're picking up extra hours. They might have people in the background, kids, um, many, many different scenarios. I know that doesn't even cover all of them. So these things that are now, you know, capturing their attention, um, those weren't there in your physical classroom. So just be aware of that. Um, you can customize your lectures to meet those needs. We've we've just accepted they're there, um, and and we're going to look at alternate ways to to work our lectures in kind of a new format. And students themselves report that they prefer lecture techniques where there's variables, um, things, activities to engage them. So they're kind of looking for their faculty to to spice it up for them. All right, it's been pretty quiet in the chat. How are we doing so far? Um, maybe I can actually just throw a question out there. I know I've moved through this fairly fast. Um, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and type in the chat. How are you doing your lectures? Are these asynchronous or are these uh, synchronous virtual sessions? Let me know what's your format. I see synchronous, hybrid, great, a little bit of both. Anyone else? Hybrid, synchronous, synchronous. Okay, great. Just was curious. Asynchronous, sure. Okay. So now that we know that we have all these things on our plate, thanks to the pandemic, we're teaching in new kind of unexplored ways, what can we do about it? So in your mind, now maybe not even from your student's perspective, but from your perspective, how do you know when you've had an effective lecture? Um, what what clues you in? What tips you off? And again, you can write on the whiteboard. So if you just join the session at the top of your screen, you should see um, a little icon. It, it looks like a capital T. Uh, if you click on that and then click on the whiteboard image on your screen, you'll be able to type. All right, I'm seeing some things coming in here. See a lot of things about student participation. They're the ones asking questions, raising their hand, making comments, participation. Students remember the information later. Yes, I, I concur. And the interesting part about participation is I think in an ideal world, we, we hope that our students will voluntarily participate. But I have heard from instructors that sometimes they feel like they're lecturing into the abyss. They they don't really know if their students have grasped the concept that they're lecturing on. It's sometimes it's silent. In which case we might have to prompt some of that participation that we would have preferred that they would have volunteered for. Okay. Fantastic. I'll go ahead and I'll erase the board. Yes, Nancy said it's very hard to read the room. Can we use a whiteboard in Zoom? Yes, there is a whiteboard feature. Um, it's under, when you go to um, share your screen, there's a tab at the top that says advanced and you'll find a whiteboard under there. Okay, I'll go ahead, I'll clear this board and then we'll move on. 
This is true. Don says you have to enable annotating for students to use the whiteboard in Zoom. Um, so this is something you can set up in your permission settings, but absolutely. So there is a definition here now on your screen um, for active learning, and this comes from Mary Ellen Weimer. She's an author of Active Learning, a Practical Guide for College Faculty. So I'll pause a moment just to let you read through that. On a whole, I will say that I, I do appreciate the definition that Mary Ellen has supplied. I suppose if I were to nitpick a little bit, um, when you're defining active learning, I hate to see the word active in the definition. However, to expand on this a little bit, I will say that uh, there is some consensus out there that when it comes to adult learners, uh, there needs to be a special emphasis on real world problem solving. If we were to look at younger learners, say in the K through 12 sector, they might still be acquiring those skills, um, learning the problem solving process. But with adults, they, they've really kind of honed those skills over time. Um, so now when adult learners come to the classroom, they're looking for examples and problems that they can solve where they can take some of their existing knowledge and expand upon it or apply it in a new direction. So while we do think of lectures oftentimes as conveying new material, um, there also needs to be this active engagement where students get to interact with it. And so that's what we're trying to incorporate into a lecture. We're not just looking at lectures as the instructor speaking the entire period. We want in the students to engage with us. And that's part of how we'll be able to break up, you know, these long sessions where we don't know what's going on with our students. Some quick tips, and we'll, we'll get into these. Um, a lecture outline is actually very helpful for adult learners. They like to know that there is a reason behind, you know, the lecture. What are we trying to accomplish? Uh, you know, give them a little bit of a roadmap. You don't have to give them all the details. There can be surprises along the way, but ultimately let them know what the, what the destination is. We do encourage the use of micro lectures. So uh, for those of you who are not sure what a micro lecture is, uh, micro lectures take your lecture content um, and they, they spit out very small chunks of information. A true micro lecture, I would argue, is about five minutes and under, All right? Um, now, why would we use these? Well, particularly right now, what we're seeing with overwhelming data is that students are more likely to engage and watch uh, a video from start to finish if it's divided up into smaller chunks. Now, I'm not suggesting that you take an entire hour long lecture and try to cram it into five minutes. That feels unreasonable. Um, however, you can take that same lecture material and divide it up into a series of videos. And this way, if your student is experiencing distractions, uh, that's okay. They'll be more likely to finish a small video, deal with the distraction, and come back and watch another video. So we're, we're very big on, on kind of breaking up uh, large quantities of information if you are recording your lectures. You may want to post shared notes. I, I think this is a pretty common practice for Blackboard, um, but again, it's this idea that things are documented. If a student missed a synchronous session, can they still find maybe that outline, things of that nature. If you are doing a synchronous session, uh, plan for those breaks. We, we had breaks even in our face-to-face -face classes, so um, you know, just allow your students you know, a moment for that, for that mental break. Let's try to get rid of the Zoom fatigue, right? You can ask them to go walk around, come back in a few moments, things like that. And of course, we're going to build in and structure these student interactions. And I promise I have some more to show you about that particular topic. Uh, 
I see one in here. There's a chat comment that says, I use Mr. Timer with relaxing music for short breaks. That is a fantastic idea. I've heard that uh, some instructors even put on music at the start of the session. So um, if as students are filtering in, they can hear music playing. It's a wonderful idea. Thank you for sharing. So we do have some of these preconditions for active student learning. Um, there's this idea of preparation. Now, again, I would say that active learning deals with problem solving. So we are going to be exploring information with our students that may be new, it may be out of their comfort zone, uh, but there are ways that you can prepare them for that. And part of that is just telling them what's on the agenda some motivation, you know, why are they going to be doing this? Um, and hopefully just this reassurance along the way, you, you can get rid of this, you know, fear that they may have of the unknown or of learning in this remote environment. Um, just keep talking them through it, right? So we're going to take a look at each of these different little aspects that you see in these cells on your screen. So um, some of these may seem familiar to you. Um, some of them might be brand new. We're going to start probably with the KWL. There's going to be a little bit of talk about a retrieval practice, focused writing, some questions that we can be asking. So just giving you a little bit on the agenda, but these are some actual strategies. And I know originally when we developed this workshop, we may have been talking about how to do this in a face-to-face -face class, but I'll be looking to you for some suggestions on how you could use this in a remote environment as well. So the KWL, let's start with this one. All right, three steps. This is what you can do with your students, right? You can come up with a topic and you can ask them, what do you think you know? What do you want to know? And then what did you learn about this particular topic? So the example that you see on your screen is about artificial intelligence. And probably a good way to break this up would be to ask maybe the first two questions at the start of a class. You know, one great exercise that you can do with your students is free writing. We could have done this in a face-to-face -face class where you could have asked everybody to pull out a sheet of paper and to start writing. Um, now, how would you maybe do this in an online format? You can throw some ideas or suggestions into the chat bar there. Nancy has the whiteboard, absolutely. Chat, surveys, polls, yes. Maybe before class have Flipgrid, yes. I'm so excited that you know about Flipgrid. That makes me very happy. Yes, yeah, so you can use technology that's outside of your LMS Blackboard system. So there's all different ideas here. Yes, I, I concur. Um, these are ideas that you can ask your students to write about. You could even ask them to turn on their microphone. I know that there's a lot of worry about using cameras, um, but microphones are, are pretty common. Right? You can hear their voices. So these first two questions, you could maybe start at the beginning of a lecture. I think a lot of times with classrooms, particularly even still in the synchronous session, instructors feel like they should just dive right into the, the topic. It's not that it's a bad idea, uh, but that starts off the cycle where we don't know what's going on with our students. Uh, it, it seems quiet. Are they paying attention or are they in another room? Um, so right off the bat, if you come up with some type of an activity, and it doesn't have to be a graded activity, um, but if you can connect with your students, just ask them, what do you think you know about this topic? Uh, see what they come up with. Um, ask them what they hope to learn. That might surprise you. And then you can start getting into the lecture about this new material. Presumably this one will be about artificial intelligence. And at the very end of the course, 
um, or at the end of the lecture, you could ask them, what did you learn about this topic? Tanisha said, definitely students seem to be more open to using their mics than putting videos on. Yes. Yes, they do. If you are doing an asynchronous course, I, I also saw somebody mention that earlier. Um, again, you could still use journal activities. Uh, some of these are even built into Blackboard and it could be a, a requirement. You don't have to grade it, um, but just put it in there as part of their, their weekly or modular activities, certainly. You can then even provide feedback on occasion if you would like. Yes, like discussion threads, absolutely. Discussion boards, same thing. You could use a discussion board and make it an ungraded activity, so that works well. So another option that you could do is a focused writing piece, since we were talking about reflections. And you can ask your students very specific questions. I see these a lot in classrooms, just maybe a daily activity. Um, so what is one piece of information that I learned um, that I, I didn't anticipate? What is one important piece of information, person, place, event, detail, fact, um, that is essential to understand about the topic? And the last one is actually one of my favorites. I, I love taking large chunks of information and trying to synthesize it into one small concrete statement. So what can I say in one sentence to share my understanding of the topic? Uh, this could be a fantastic class exercise. Um, something that you could do is you could even ask your students to do this as a piece of homework and you could post all of their responses, maybe make it anonymous um, for everyone to see. All right. So I do also have another um, possible uh, resource for you to take a look at and I apologize it came out a little bit uh, teeny on here, but if you can see on the slide, the source is from retrievalpractice.org. They have many, many different resources about how to get your students engaged in talking or communicating in some form, just so that you know that they are paying attention I and mean, getting something out of your lecture material. One of the things that they suggest um, are warm-ups. Now, warm-ups, I think most instructors use that with you know, a, a little bit of caution. Uh, Warm-up activities, as retrievalpractice.org um, suggests, are actual just kind of topics or um, conversation starters that maybe aren't even necessarily attached to the course, um, but they suggest warm-ups if you have maybe a group of students who are particularly silent or reluctant to communicate. I think they, I was on there today, one of the suggested topics was, you know, what is your least favorite flavor of ice cream and why? Um, sometimes something silly will actually just um, engage conversation. So you can use this with a little bit of discretion. You know, you don't want to get too off topic with your course, but um, sometimes you can incorporate activities maybe that even aren't content related. They have two things learned. You know, what are things that you learned in a prior course in the summer or about the course? And of course, there is um, the brain dump, which I, I don't know if I love that uh, phrase, but um, a lot of times it, it can be like a um, brainstorming exercise where you include everyone in the course, where sometimes you'll just give them a topic and everybody needs to contribute. What do you know about this topic? Um, so pretty similar to some of those um, previous slides, but again, ways to engage with a course that, you know, maybe you're just not seeing a lot of connection amongst your students. And Greg says that he starts with a question of the day, but the question relates at least a little bit to the course or the field of study. Yes. Great. 
it's again this idea that even though we are lecturing we're presenting new material to our students it's essential that they have this information um, we're trying to dispel this feeling of being an actor and I, I've actually heard some instructors say that they feel like they're actors now that they just record their lecture and they hope that somebody watches it so we're, we're trying to dispel that feeling. Lectures are still interactive components of a course, even in a virtual or remote setting. All right, so a discussion activity. Maybe how could you use one of the techniques that we just covered um, in a course that you teach? retrieval practice, um, focused writing, KWL, what do you know, what do you want to know, what have you learned? Thoughts on this? Are, are any of you considering maybe using one or more of these tactics in your course? Mariana likes the retrieval practice idea with a question of the day. And Greg says that I also use anticipation guides sometimes at the beginning of a lecture. All right, I see some votes for KWL, focused writing, um, but more of a sum of the material. Yes. Focus writing. Okay, so at least it, it kind of has you thinking maybe I could use one or more of these ideas or I could tweak it. Great. Tanisha says KWL using theories discussed in class. Yes, absolutely. So here I, I did throw onto the screen um, kind of a diagram of micro lectures. And I would say that um, there's actually three tiers to this. So um, there's the top, the middle, and the bottom row. Um, all of the top row kind of sync together. That's different ways to think about it. Um, same for the middle and the bottom after that. But how do you go about structuring a micro lecture? Um, we have actually had some Teaching Effectiveness Institute um, guest speakers who who came in and spoke to us about this but if you didn't have a chance to attend or um, you might have missed it it's kind of this idea that we also are trying to take our main points of maybe perhaps a longer lecture and condense them into something that is smaller and more manageable for our students to to watch or I'm assuming it, this is a record lecture, I guess, um, or even just to listen to in a synchronous session. So allow me to, to correct myself on that. Um, again, lectures can come in many different formats. So I, I'm trying to speak to both of those. If I don't, if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, but this whole first tier right here that you're looking at is to focus on a particular objective. This could be a learning objective for the course or a learning objective just for that activity. Uh, you might even have tips that you are giving to your students, things that they need to know. And then you can tell them a little bit about, well, this is an important issue, why? Um, and then you give them all of the, the corresponding data. You might be using your micro lectures kind of as a, a stopgap between two points. So in the past, we've looked at X, Y, and Z. Um, now let's focus on this. And of course, there's a conclusion. I do particularly like the middle slide there at the bottom row um, where it tells you, at the end of this video, you should be able to correctly answer these two main questions. And, and you supply them with two questions. So if you stayed on task for yourself, or if you do a micro lecture, then your students should be able to come up with you know, two really good responses to these questions. Um, so it's kind of this itinerary, both for you as an instructor, if you're trying to get out as much information in a short amount of time as possible, um, but it's also an itinerary for your students. If they truly followed along, 
paid attention to the lecture, um, you know, they started making the connection between their prior knowledge um, as well as the new content that you just included in this video, um, then they also should be able to, at the very end of the video, answer that, that question or those two questions, however many questions you feel is necessary. All right. Another option that we have is a think, pair, share. And you can still do activities with students, whether this is a synchronous lecture or an asynchronous lecture. And this is the idea where your students are asked to think about a concept, um, come up maybe with an answer to a specific question. Um, after they have come up with their own personal answer, they are paired together uh, and they get to talk back and forth about it something and then they share it as a group. So, pardon me, um, one idea here is that you want your students maybe to, again, come up with a very specific answer um, in order for this to work. So you might give them a complex problem, you might give them um, a case study, but a good way to make sure that this actually works effectively is to have your student write down or type out their answer. Um, they need to actually come up with something concrete before you pair them with another student. And then they get to share it uh, reflectively with the course. So my personal background is in English, so that's often where my mind goes to. Um, an example of how this can work effectively is um, in the past I have given material to my students. Uh, the material that I gave them was actually um, a writing prompt. And along with the writing prompt, I gave them the corresponding rubric, the grading rubric. Um, when I gave them this assignment, I then showed them actual examples of student um, writing. And I asked them, based on the writing prompt and the attached rubric, to determine what grade this piece of writing deserved. So they actually had to physically write out the grade that they would have assessed. Was it an A paper, a B paper, a C paper? Um, everybody came up with their own individual answer. Uh, I then paired them up, or again, you can use small groups that can even uh, get more interesting depending on the size of your course. And as a group, they had to look at each other's work. Did they all come up with the same grade? Did they come up with different grades? As a group, they then collectively had to convince each other that they knew what grade to assign the student writing. Um, it's a great exercise. Each of the groups then got to look around the rest of the classroom and see where they stood. So again, it's this idea that they are taking concepts, um, thinking about it on their own, um, but then they're collaborating with their peers. So this could be done in a remote setting as well. Um, you can do this in an asynchronous course. Um, there are many different options. One of the things that you could do is you could ask your students after they've assessed a grade uh, to turn them into you so that you can actually see what did they come up with. Um, and then you pair them up. So I do encourage you when you come up with these activities to think about um, how your students interact. Uh, don't let them slide with um, non-answers. I think this is something that can happen, particularly when we're sitting at home and we can't see our students, um, make them come up with an actual answer before you pair them up. That is my one note of caution. All right, let's look at some other options here. We also have the Jigsaw group projects. So um, this is where everybody is, oh, we've got a strange echo in here. Can everyone still hear me? Okay, great. Just want to make sure I had an echo in my headset. The Jigsaw Project is this idea that your students are in a group and each person is responsible for a certain piece. Uh, they are very specifically tasked with one piece of the assignment, um, but in order for the whole project to come together, everybody needs to, to do their own part. And I have seen this work well. I have seen it where um, 
there's a large amount of textbook reading and I know personally that um, I have a hard time getting my students to read the textbook even though it, it's really beneficial and there's a lot of content there that needs to be explored um, this is something that I've struggled with so um, one thing that I could do is I might ask that somebody be responsible for chapter one, somebody be responsible for chapter two, somebody be responsible for chapter three. Um, when it's your turn to review the chapter, I could invite my students then to do a presentation on their particular piece. Now, realistically, I can't say that, well, Susie or Joe or, or whoever, you know, didn't do a very good presentation um, and therefore my students are not um, responsible for understanding that information. Um, no, that's not true. I, I do want and expect my students to, to read the, the textbook assignment. However, it would be really nice if everybody took a, a piece of that, that whole pie, right, and they brought up, you know, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I see that Mariana just asked, well, how can we do jigsaw groups in Zoom? Uh, each time that um, somebody has to present, you could give them, uh, you know, the capabilities to share their screen, right? They could have a document showing all the different highlights of that particular chapter, and maybe they have a PowerPoint. Uh, maybe they just want to get on the mic and, quickly synthesize, you know, these are the, the main bullet points of chapter three or chapter four. Uh, so again, letting your students chime in, uh, teach the class, but everybody takes a segment. Um, how do you organize the groups in breakout rooms? Well, there are a couple pieces to this. Um, we can always follow that up after this um, workshop as well. I can send you very specific um, instructions for that. So part of it is you need to make sure that you have uh, breakout rooms enabled in Zoom. And um, then I usually assign groups once they've once the students have entered the Zoom session. Now the nice part about it is uh, you can keep reusing that same group. So um, if you say, all right, I want all of you in group one to get together, have a conference, let's meet back together as a main group in five minutes, um, you can do that. And then if you need them to get back together with their, with their group mates, you can reuse those same breakout rooms. So if you need specific instructions on how to use that, I would say just contact myself or the CIDL team and we can uh, show you the steps involved. Um, but again, it's this idea that holding your students accountable. Uh, you don't have to do all of the lecturing. There, there's no reason to suggest that your students couldn't cover some lecture material. Um, and everybody takes a small piece, a small segment, and uh, teaches the class. Great. All right, so I have another uh, whiteboard up on the screen for you. So we've got about 15 minutes left. I, I think we can get through this fairly quickly. Um, how do you think you would use the Think, Pair, Share or a jigsaw strategy in your own course? And this could, again, vary because I know some of you are doing hybrid, some of you are doing synchronous sessions, and some of you are doing asynchronous sessions right now. So um, this could be, you know, kind of an interesting answer to, to go over. All right, I see a case study or a patient situation. Great, this, I'm assuming this is maybe from a nursing or a health field. Case studies are absolutely fantastic. They take isolated incidents and ask students to use their knowledge um, to maybe solve a problem. 
I like to use case studies um, kind of as almost a write the ending of the story. So um, you can present a case study, you can give them all sorts of information to maybe try to solve a mystery um, and ask your students how do they predict that it ended. So this can often be interesting to compare their answers to how, you know, an actual study um, concluded. Um, I see when I use jog saw in face to face, but as was asked, not sure how to do in a synchronous session. I'm sorry, what's a Uh, jigsaw. Um, the jigsaw, it depends on what you're trying to do in the synchronous session. So um, I, I usually like to ask one of my students to start off the presentation and I'll give them, you know, the sharing privileges. And this again, it depends on which type of synchronous session you're using, whether that's Zoom, Teams, um, or collaborate, as well as your own personal session settings. So some of this has to be determined on a personal basis. Um, I don't assume that everybody's Zoom sessions are structured the same. So it, it also comes down to enabling uh, specific permission rights so that your students can share with the course. Um, sometimes it's just as simple as turning on a microphone. Other times you may need to give them permission rights so that they can share their um, their PowerPoint, or if you've um, asked your students to record their own mini micro lecture, um, sometimes you might have them actually sharing their own recorded video. So there's a lot of different strategies here. Um, if you have a specific, you know, technology need, just let me know. I, I think that would probably be best solved on a face-to-face -face or one-on-one -on -one setting. Great. All right, so somebody already said a case study. Yes, I am a big fan of case studies. Um, this again inserts that problem solving aspect that we're looking for in adult learner classrooms. Um, we're looking at analytical tools, um, quantitative or qualitative as appropriate for the case. Um, so by this, it just means, are, how do your students react to that particular case? Um, you can actually, um, if it's something that's very scientific, you might want to do this, uh, you know, at a quantitative level. You know, did your students arrive at the uh, right answer? Or, you know, were they very close to the right answer, but they made, you know, one or two crucial mistakes? Versus um, if this is maybe more of a complex social dilemma, um, that deals with things like logic and ethics, then you might want to take this more at a qualitative stance and, you know, ask your students to reflect on, you know, what is their overall impression of this particular problem. So again, we're asking our students to use their decision-making still decision-making skills in complex situations, um, and we also want them to develop strategies for dealing with some of these um, ambiguities. So I'm going to get to open it up here a little bit for questions. Um, I'm trying to get to the, the end of our presentation. I know we've got about eight minutes left. So feel free to type away in the chat. Let me know if you have um, questions, if there's anything I can clarify. Or if not, do you have a question about active learning? Yes, this recording it will be available. I'm going to send you a link in an email. It might not go out today, uh, but I will get it to you this week. All right. Nancy, you struggle with technology. I get that impression a lot from, uh, you know, just 
instructors. And I think it's because we have so much technology at our fingertips that it actually can feel overwhelming. Um, it, it can be an overabundance. So I by no means wanted to um, suggest that you didn't have questions about how to use your technology um, with these concepts. Uh, I just think that it's usually dealt with, you know, kind of on a one on one uh, basis just so that we can take a look at your course and make sure we're meeting your individual needs. But if you're struggling with that technology, uh, that is what the CIDL team is for. And um, I will pop up my information at the end of this presentation. So please feel free to send me uh, a message. We can even just set up consultations to make sure that we've, we've addressed your needs. Don says, I'm struggling to figure out how to do everything at once. Mini lectures while meeting synchronously, but having a uh, mini lecture style material for those who can't attend. Yes. And maybe it's not about doing everything. Maybe it's about finding one or two points that appeal to you. Uh, certainly the way you set up your lecture might be different from somebody else's. So um, I, I don't think I would try to compound all of these different components, but maybe experiment with one or two that you you haven't used or haven't used very much. Don asks, should I pre-record some of the content and stream it in class? You can certainly do that. Um, my feeling on a lot of the recorded material is that I can make it available to my students um, asynchronously so that I can maximize our time together. But if you have a particular clip that you think is going to be really relevant to that lecture or that activity, then absolutely I would do it. I don't typically recommend um, using your entire synchronous session to watch recordings. So I would just, you know, look at the amount of time you have together and, and try to think about how you can use video clips um, effectively. But other than that, I think students really do enjoy video clips. Um, I think, again, the, the emphasis there is on the clips. Yes, you can definitely be interactive without cameras. Uh, one complaint that the students are voicing is that they had to work double when uh, they went to shut down. I think that's a feeling um, that's echoed with faculty too. Um, everybody feels uh, a little bit fatigued right now. So we're trying to figure out ways that we can get the most out of our work, um, but in the most reasonable amount of time. So some of these things I, I know we've already covered. I'm getting down to our last five minutes, so I'm going to try to breeze through some of these um, slides. You can use polling, small groups, whiteboard, audio, video, maybe. That, that's up to you. Um, I know that there's a lot of uh, debate about whether video is appropriate in synchronous sessions or not. Uh, text chat, sharing files, and sharing screens. You can ask your students to do all these things that you're doing. So um, you, know, you can ask them to share screens as well. Um, I know this shows you how to use a polling feature um, currently in Collaborate, but since we have so many different uh, systems available to us, this might not apply to you if you're in Zoom or Teams. Um, so I'm going to skip through these. You can also create concept maps as a class. This is a particularly fun exercise if you turn on your whiteboard features. Um, so they can actually be in charge of the mapping. You don't have to do all of it. So um, again, it's this idea that they are interacting with you, even if you don't see their face, um, they, they need to contribute. So it's a, a fun activity just to get them thinking. All right, so these are our different um, interactions, hopefully that we've talked about. Small group activities, the think, pair, share. I'm getting students to interact with that content. Maybe that's the content mapping. Um, could be interesting if you ever ask your students to do content mapping in an asynchronous session um, and then send you um, a screenshot. You can compare concept maps at a course level. It can be really kind of engaging. Learner to learner and, of course, learner to instructor.
All right, I, I know we don't have time for a Padlet, but we might be able to do this in the chat. Um, which lecture strategies have you tried before? Um, were they successful? Were they not successful? Or if you prefer option B, you can go with the orange text box here. Which lecture strategies do you think you want to try with your course? Um, and which do you think would work best for your subject matter? And I'll go ahead. I know we're down to our last couple of minutes. If you have to leave, that's perfectly fine. Um, if not, I, I'm happy to hang around and answer some questions for you. I will throw my contact information up onto the screen. And I know one strategy that I also like to use, um, especially right now in this remote location, is um, if I am doing a lecture in a synchronous session and I want to call in a student, I, I often print off my roster. Um, I'll pick a number. Whoever's name corresponds with that number gets to answer. Uh, but then I'll ask that student, you know, okay, pick you the next number. Um, and they'll call on somebody else that's in the course. Um, it's just this great way of feeling like, Everybody has to be ready to respond. Uh, you know, it, it feels a little bit spontaneous. Um, and it could be as simple as just asking, OK, number seven is Sam Smith. Uh, Sam, can you type your answer to this question in the chat pod? Um, so again, it, it's this idea that at any moment, somebody could ask you to engage. So I, I did want to throw that out there as just something else. It's very easy, but um, still gets people to respond. Whiteboard is easy, low risk, sure, absolutely. Can I please provide more information about concept mapping? Yes, and I am going to be sending out a follow-up email, so I'll also try to include some um, other resources about concept mapping. Um, Concept mapping is a great way to kind of brainstorm. Um, it's something that we use um, traditionally, I would say, um, at the start of a, a lesson plan. You might start thinking about what do you already know? Um, how does it branch off? Um, it's also a, a good way to get students to um, think about their existing knowledge. Sometimes uh, students don't realize that they already have some existing knowledge uh, that will contribute to their learning of something that seems brand new and foreign. So um, I do have some ideas on how to use that in an online setting. So I'll be sure to send you some links for that as well. So um, I'll put the link to the recording, um, as well as how to incorporate this just you know, in an online format. All right, so yes, in online format, um, one thing that you can do is I like having actually a template up on the whiteboard since I, I see a lot of uh, hands going up for the whiteboard. So that's a great way. Um, you just put the concept map up there, maybe fill in the central bubble, uh, and you get to have all of your students fill in kind of the spindles. No worries. I know we're at time. So um, again, thank you everybody for attending. Please let me know um, if you have any questions. You can hop on the mic or in the chat pod. Let me know.